good? Yeah, the ones that stay right in there. Right here. Yeah, right in that area. Right on the corner of this, we're good? Yep. You want a marker? Uh, no, we're good. We can use this corner as a marker. Right in front of that's the marker. Kevin will fire up, we're, we're good on both. Hey, thank you all for coming again. That We've got a lot of the regulars and a couple of new people, and uh, we really appreciate you coming. We're, as always, we're going we're gonna to give you some free lures for coming because you, you deserve a little, little bit of an advantage over those who watch online. We appreciate our online viewers, as always, whether you watch it live online or whether you watch it after the fact. It just adds to the experience that we all gain from this. So... Uh, Again, I want to thank you all. We got Billy Lawson tonight. We got Justin Crawford, and we got Michael, who's going to continue his discussions about electronics. And I think I also want to thank a number of you have asked about our dear friend Justin Rackley. And you know what? He's kept his attitude up, and he's he's got in good hands medically now. And and there's going to be some a benefit terminal on Lake Rayburn for him. So it's, there's a shirt sale program going on online. So thank you for your prayers for Justin. I know he would would tell that to you if he were here. So since he can't be, I'm going to say it for him. He's a wonderful young man and like family to all of us. So again, I, I just want to let, leave you alone. And I'm also, also going to suggest one more thing. Tonight, if you have any suggested topics for two weeks from tonight or for the future, I'm going to ask you to, to let us know what they are because we want these seminars to be responsive to your needs. And we don't necessarily know what you want help in, but we're going to try to tailor them to your needs. So if you would, please do that. You raise your hand anytime, as always, and ask questions. And um, I thank you for coming. Okay? And we'll give you some, a sample bag later. Plus, as always, I'm going to give you a full bag of some of the lures we're talked about tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ronnie. All right. A little bit lighter crowd tonight. That's all right. We were able to fit in the room this time. Last time we couldn't even fit in here, so that's good. Hey, I have been dealing with some off the water stuff. I have actually only been on the water one day this week. Um, the, the fishing that I was doing just kind of be real quick tonight. I'm going to let these guys get after it. Um, grass related fishing, I've gone back to solely grass related fishing. The offshore bite has got so time oriented for me on Lake Fork that I'm having a very difficult time keeping up with the time on the offshore. So I'm going back to where I'm just pounding away in the grass. There are still plenty of fish in that grass. Those fish that are Summer in there, uh, Mike saw some of them with me. We went out for a few hours on the one day. There's, he can attest, there's a lot of bass in that grass. Um, but much like the offshore fish, it's a timing thing. I'm just a lot better at the timing of it back there because I spent more time doing it. Um, the weightless plastics have become a big key, much like I'm sure some of the, the plastics offshore have become a big key. Uh, the, the wacky worms, the zigzag is still a big key play for me. The magic shad, all, all types of weightless plastics have become a really big factor for me is we've got into the part of summer where we just grind. I mean, this is this is it. This is where you grind away. I mean, you can hit those windows where they really feed, shallow or deep, and you catch a bunch in a hurry. But other than that, throughout the day, it's pretty much a pretty tough fishing right now. It's, it's a grind. Uh, the good news is we've had some cooler weather. I don't think we're going to have a real drastic turnover this year. If we have any at all, it's going to be a small one, I think, because... All this cold water coming into the lake the last week with the rain should, I mean, it's kept that thermocline broken up, so we shouldn't have too bad of a turnover. So we should look for an early fall bite. I'm actually already, right now, starting to try and look for some of those tendencies as those fish start moving into. Every time we get a little cool shot of water from the rain or whatever, I'm looking for those fall patterns to start setting up, the swim bait stuff. Uh, some of the flipping patterns that we get into as we move into fall, uh, I'm starting to kind of look that way. So. The best advice I can give anybody coming to fish a lake for right now is for me, I'm fishing shallow. I want grass that grows in at least four or five foot of water, and I want to be real versatile and be prepared to be real finesse. And that's about it. A couple changes, not, not really changes, but just things that I'm going to ask you guys. Um, tonight, if you could, if you have a question, 
and it's something that you, you have a question on something directly they're talking about, go ahead. But we're going to try and do our Q&A at the end with all three of us at once like we kind of did last week or two weeks ago. So that's going to kind of be the format tonight on the Q&A. If you have some good questions, please hold on, on to them until the end. We do appreciate your questions. You guys online, just punch yours in whenever you're ready. We can read those at the end. We will get to every question that we can at the end of the seminar. So, hey, we appreciate all you guys coming. I'm going to bring up my buddy, old Justin Crawford, over here playing with cats like he always does. <laughs> Justin's actually going to get a new topic tonight. Um, he's going to talk to you a little bit about crappie fishing. So something a little different. We're going to get to hear a little, little new aspect. Oh, my goodness. Can y'all see this? I know y'all. Some most of y'all can't. That cat is freaking out. All right, buddy, get after him on the crop and let him know what's good. Yes, sir. Thank you, Boone. How are you guys doing tonight? Thank y'all for coming out. First of all, appreciate all y'all. Um, first, I'll start talking to y'all about my bass fishing. I've been catching during the daytime, and like Lily said, uh, it's that time of year where it's a grind, and uh, it's all about timing, pulling up to the fish at the right time. Um, right now, I'm focusing on depth of 18 to 25 foot of water, and I'm focusing on river channel swings pumps and points, secondary points and main lake points. Um, a lot of graphing, when I pull up to these spots, I'll look for, I've put brush piles out myself here recently to kind of help me out, mainly willow trees, that's what my favorite thing to put out. Um, when I pull up these spots, I'll just graph, and um, I have some spots where I may graph two, three hundred yards, I have some spots where I graph maybe a hundred yards, but I'll stay in that depth range and try to see the amount of bait fish that I'm looking for and then the bass set up the right way. When I mean set up the right way, they're going to be pretty close to these bait balls and they're going to be suspended off the bottom in between the bottom and the bait. And how I've been catching my fish during the day is when I pull up on two, I'm drop shotting and I'm Carolina rigging. That's how I'm catching my fish during the daytime right now. Um, on my drop shot, I hate having to go light line because I have no fear of breaking off big fish, but that's the only way I'm able to get bit right now is using 10 pound line. If you go down to eight, you'll get bit even more, but you'll break off a lot. When you get up to that 12, 15 pound liter, you're not getting bit near as much. And I don't think it has a lot to do with the sight. I think it has a lot to do with the action of the bait. Um, same with my Carolina rig. I'm only using 12 pound liter on my Carolina rig, monofilament on my, my Carolina rigs. And I'm working them really, really, really slow. And the key to my drop shot is when I'm throwing it out there, long casting it, I want to have a lot of tension in my line. I don't want that line slack. It take, defeats the whole purpose of the drop shot. Your, your worm's just laying on the bottom. It's just suspended up. And um, I'm running about a 16 inch liter from my weight to my hook on my drop shot and half ounce weight. And how I rig up my weight is not the traditional drop shot way. Um, the hooks that you can buy that have the swivel inside of them, I feel like as I'm using them all day, that swivel's not turning every time it should. Sometimes it does get hung up. And whenever I get it up, I see I have one out of every five casts, maybe one out of every three casts, depending on how much stumps and structure I'm around. I'm pulling it up and I'm seeing my worm spinning. So what I'm doing is I'm just getting a regular half ounce eggshell weight that has a pretty good hole in the middle of it. And I'm sticking it up my line and I'm just tying a split ring at the bottom of it. And then the weight just sits on that split ring. And everything that I'm touching and going across that, that uh, egg weight will swivel a lot better than your traditional drop shot weight will. So, and then awesome. on my Carolina. Awesome. Yes, sir. And uh, it'll save you a lot. You know, I, I feel like I'm getting bit more by doing that as well, too. It's giving a lot more action to my worm. And on my drop shots, I'm, the only bait I've been drop shotting and colored has been the needle worm, Lake Fork Trophy needle worm and the uh, red bug. Wow. And I'm biting off about an inch and a half to two inches off the worm, and I'm rigging it uh, just like you would a Texas rig. I don't just go through the nose, I, I rig it weedless. And uh, that's just to keep you from getting hung up. You may, you know, not your hookup ratio isn't as great, but if you don't do it the way that I'm talking about, you're going to spend half the day getting yourself hung up and breaking off the drop shots over and over and over. I'm using uh, an owner hook, a uh, number two owner hook, drop shot hook, specifically made for drop shotting. They're pretty extensive, but they've been great for me as far as not losing fish. On my Carolina rigs, um, I'm also working then with the drop shot. It's nothing but throwing it out there, and I mean, I'm just my, having my customers throw it out there. I mean, as painfully as slow as you can reel it back to the boat is how we're working. And the Carolina rig's the same way, but I'll have them every now and then. I'd say about every third to, to fifth pull in, I have them jerk it a little bit, and not too hard, but just a little bit in case that fish is falling in or nosing up to the bait and curious in it. Sometimes that subtle little rip and that movement of that bait will sometimes trigger them up and have them fire. And on my Carolina rigs, I'm throwing the uh, Sartreuse uh, baby creature, 
Not the big one, but the baby creature. And it's got a lot of action to it. And I'm even dipping my tail in the uh, Sartreuse dipping glove on my Carolina rigs. A lot of guys on the, the lake right now are catching their fish on shaky heads. And I'm catching them as well, but I just feel like going down with that lighter leader on the Carolina and drop shot, I'm getting more bites. And I'm also getting big fish as well. Uh, I still am doing my um, uh, shaky head, but I'm doing my shaky head when I'm nice fishing, which I'll get to that in just a little bit because I'm doing a lot of that here lately. Um, crappie during the day. I'm focusing really on the same type of uh, areas that I am for my bass. And the willow trees that I put out is really the only thing that I've been fishing during the day. And when I pull up to them, you'll know it right off the bat. I mean, out of the seven that I'll put in one area, the two or three that will hold, when you pull up to it, I mean, they'll just be loaded on it pretty good. And it's kind of the time you deal with the crappie as well. They'll frustrate you. You'll see them on the screen. They're there. You can pull up to them. It can be one of three things. A whack fest, 30 minutes of fishing, getting them triggered up, or you fish for two hours and don't get a bite. And how I'm fishing... Um, it is on a quarter ounce weight, and I'm hardly, I'm just dead sneaking. When I sink it down to that depth, I sink it down to the bottom of my brush pile, and I roll about three cranks up, and I'm just literally just letting it sit there. You know what I mean? As still as you can possibly let it. I'm not even really working it all. I'm kind of letting the, the water and the waves kind of do the working for me. And when it gets windy, instead of retying a heavier weight on it, I'll just go up about, I don't know, eight inches to a foot and just tie a, or pinch a, 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 a pinch weight on there, a slip. And then at nighttime, of course, you know, I'm using the darker colors. And the same thing with uh, the nighttime fishing, I'm focusing on brush piles and bridge pylons. A lot of the 515 bridge and 154 uh, bridge, I put a lot of uh, brush piles out on there as well. And where those river channels swing in and they funnel those bass that are feeding at night, I'm focusing a lot on there. And I may sit on those where those river channels are coming in at nighttime, I may sit up for two or three hours, and it, it usually does pay off. You know, you only get maybe two bites an hour, but they're usually good fish. And how I'm fishing those uh, at nighttime for my bass, I'm using three different baits. I'm using a shaky head with the uh, lake fork worm on it in a darker color because it's nighttime. The blue bruiser, or yeah, blue bruiser, the green pumpkin works good, and uh, slow playing it, chunking it out there, and as slow as you can possibly pull it back. And uh, that's probably been my bigger fish at night, has been off the shaky head. Uh, my numbers have been coming off the uh, half ounce Midnight Series Santon Spinnerbait. And it has a Colorado blade on it, and it's black and blue. And we're slow playing as, as slow as we can around that brush and around those bridge pylons that have the brush on them. Um, what size shaky head do you use? I use the 5 8 ounce five shaky eight. head. Yes, sir. So I know that I stay on the bottom. I'm in that deeper water with my shaky heads in the fall. In the spring, I'll go to that quarter ounce or that eighth ounce, you know, more finesse. But I like to know that I'm on the bottom. With my Carolina rigs, I'm using three-quarter ounce weights on my Carolina rigs to make sure that I'm down there. I'm trying to see what else. Um, the colors that have been working for me good during the daytime for crappie have been the, uh, I didn't see it over there, but they have the electric chicken. I know that Mr. Parker has it. That's been one of my really good producers. And then on cloudy days, that little bit of gold, that gold shiner has been really good for me here lately with this overcast during the daytime. And then at night, just a little bit darker lure, uh, baits, uh, darkest ones you can find, the blue bruiser and the black pearl. The darker, the better at night. And at nighttime, you don't have to fish it as slow as you would during the daytime. You can kind of, you know, move your crappie lure a little bit, you know, more than you would during the day because they seem like they're a lot more active, especially the crappie at nighttime. And we may have to do something with the full moon or cooler water, but last three or four nights we've been wearing the crappie out. And they've been sitting in about 18 to 22 foot of water around the brush. Guys, we're going to get sold the questions till the very end. Mr. McFarland? Good job. You ready to go? Yeah. Great job. Good job. Sir, thank you. We do have a few questions myself, but we'll save them for the end. Thank you Thanks very much. Good. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, guys, we ready for this part two. Part two. Um, so let's do this. You have to remember this. We're going to do a little bit of a refresh. So for those of you that are on, uh, on the Facebook Live, last week we did um, part one of the seminar on sonar interpretation. Um, if you want to go back and watch that, it would be a lot easier. But I'm going to do a quick summary. So let everybody can kind of refresh before I go into part two, which is going to be down scan imaging. Part three is going to be side scan imaging. 
Okay, that's two weeks from today. And the final part four will be navigating, navigation. Um, some of the next three seminars today, side scan and the, the navigating, are also going to include waypoints and things like that. Um, trails will come in the final navigation. So today we are going to talk about a little bit of waypoints and what this down scan imaging is capable of doing for you. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is back you guys up to last week when we talked about what does a fish actually look like on a sonar. For the camera there, refresh yourself, take that, pass it around the room. That's what a non-moving fish looks like with a properly set sonar. Okay, we're going to talk about the settings. If you need that, go back and watch Seminar 1. You can do that. Here's what the big fish should look like on your sonar. When you're really looking for the big giant fish, that's what they should look like when they are not moving. Okay? Remember when the fish move, they become lines. They start to actually have lines, caterpillars. That's when they're actually moving or attacking. So when you have a full boomerang or full arch, the fish is not moving. Okay? Lines when they're moving. Question. Who's the yellow? Is that their back or is that their elbow? That's the bone. So in the first seminar, we talked about the three colors, red, yellow, and blue. Blue softest, red semi-soft, and yellow hard. Um, that yellow is triggering off the bone and the head of the bass. Um, sometimes the drum and carp and other things can come up and look very similar. Carp will tend to have more of elongated instead of the boomerang. Okay? Drum sometimes will boomerang because they're shorter and stocky like a bass. Drum grow this way, carp grow this way. Um, but that's your basis, okay? And if you weren't here last week, the colors is how they can tell sizes. So that very first one going around, you got some little blue marks, you got some blue-red marks, and you got the blue, red, and yellow marks. Those are your bigger fish, the blue being the small fish, okay? So that's what fish look like. If you're wondering what a bass looks like, that's what the bass look like. Now, we've taken this to a new deal. Down scan imaging. Does anybody have any idea what that really is? Is what is it doing? What's it creating? If the sonar is sending a signal out and it's reproducing, reproducing an image by an echo, okay, that means the echo is received and the computer is kind of telling it what it thinks it is. A down scan is actually very much like a lady having a sunburn. Okay? You can tell whether it's a boy or a girl. Okay? You can tell whether that tree breaks to the right, does it have any limbs. So in this particular one, I passed this around last week. On the left is your sonar, typical sonar with a tree. On the right is your down scan with a tree. You can actually tell and count all the appendages and the limbs on the right. This particular image on the right is a little bit weak in the settings. The setting could be brought up so that would show more definition. But now you can see where we used to wonder, what the heck is that big old blob? And someone would say, well, I know what it is. It's trees. Well, how many? I'm not sure in the old sonar. When I go to this down scan, and this is my point of the lesson, the down scan imaging shows the true image of what's down there, provided a couple important things. Number one, obviously, the settings have to be right. Okay? Your basic settings have to be right. Your auto settings on that are pretty standard with the down scan image. You're not getting a good image, it's because there's something wrong with the sonar transmitter, the transducer. It's not level, something's wrong. But pretty much auto settings for down scan work fine. Okay? What happens to us that trick really kind of intrigues us, it does it first, is you have to use a little bit of imagination. When you look in that, you can tell it's a tree, right? You can see that. Well, when you're idling around, sometimes you may be moving or you may be turning. We're specifically talking about down scan imaging. If you go over the top of a hump and you're scanning in the middle of a turn, it's going to be distorted. You're not going to see what you need to do, what you want. Side scanning doesn't. Okay? Side scanning does not distort as near as much unless you turn aggressively. So a couple of real important factors. Your settings, set them for down scan. If you have a down scan, set them just on basic auto. I do tweak them as water colors change, depths change. There are some tweaks in advanced classes that we can progress you to. But for the main down scan, you just want to really use it as confirmation. I do use a sonar at the same time as I use a down scan. This is a great image that Kevin made for me today. The reason being, 
is I can reconfirm the sonar is telling me that this is a school of bait that's kind of been busted up and I got one, maybe a couple big bass down here. When I go to the down scan, it doesn't leave anything out. It produces an image of what's really there. You can see in that 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 bait ball actually isn't broken up, it's round. And that is one big bass down there. When you look, you'll see the one big blip, okay? So here I'm not sure. Is it one, two, three? I've got some waves in it. Here is confirmation. It's a round ball and the bait, one big fish beneath it. So I run my down scan for two reasons. Search and study for structure. We're going to get to that in some next images. So I want to actually know for sure what's down there. Is it a bridge pylon? Is it a tree stump? Is it an oak tree? Is it a cedar tree? Does it have big limbs? So my down scan is like binoculars underwater, adding to what my sonar can't give me. Okay, I don't have to interpret anymore. I can see clear what's down there. What's really unique about a down scan is it can be as crystal clear as that. That's a big oak tree laying across a creek. Okay, now, as that goes around, I want you to look and tell me where the fish are on it. For your own good, you have to actually tell me. But take a close look and see if you can tell where the fish are. And if on a sonar, fish comes up as a big arch and a big hook, what does it come up on as a down scan? Just a blip, right? Because it's just, like, that's what the down scan does. So it's actually going to show you the little ball, okay? By the size of the ball, in other words, if I took a pencil and I made a little dot, and then I took a marker and I made a dot, and then I took a bigger marker and made a dot, I'm going to have different size dots, right? Three different size dots. So you're going to see in this that if you look in the top, the sonar, you're going to have some pretty good arches. When you get close in this, uh, bottom image is hard to see, and I apologize, it's a reflection off of my sonar. But you're going to notice the bigger blips in amongst there. Those bigger blips are the big bass that are down in there. So I want to use that one real quick before that actually gets passed around. I'm going to use this just a little bit more. In the old days, we didn't have down scan. I would see something like that and say, whoa, I've got the mother load, a whole bunch of big bass on the top. The sonar tells me I've got a whole bunch of mother load. Down on the down scan, it's pretty doggone good, and I'm going to fish it, but I recognize real quick that it's not the mother load. Up here, it looks like there's probably 30 or 40 fish. Down here, there's about 15. Why don't you take a close look? That's why I use that down scan for more confirmation and a study of the bottom. And we're going to talk about studying the bottom here in a second. Remember in the first seminar, I had a, I had a deal go around that... I've already sent it once. I think I did. That talked about being able to find the fish in the trees. Here it is here. In the old traditional sonar, you can see the yellow hooks in the trees. Okay? Well, in this sonar, in the down scan, you can also see the blips in the trees. So if you look right here at the bottom of this arrow where I'm telling you the end of the arrow, if you look at the one, two, three, four big blips, ironically, you come over here in this tree, you'll have <laughs> one, two, three, four big blips. So this was how we used to find fish. This makes it easier. Makes it quicker. It makes it more, I'm more confident. This was my interpretation. It took me years and years and years to be sure that my interpretation was right <laughs> with the three big arches. This here helped me expedite. Okay, so you should have a down scan. You can almost not have this, but the two work together. Okay? Confirmation back and forth. Okay? From everything from the fish, the size of fish, to the bottom contour. Remember I talked about hard bottom, soft bottom? If you'll notice on this, there's a great image for this. You can see the hard yellow spots, right? Do you see them highlighting in the, in the down scan? So that down scan image can also show you your hard bottoms, just like a side scan, I mean a regular sonar. Okay? So one guy would say, well, Mike, we don't even need that no more. And what I just taught you, you should say, no, we do. Because you still want to bounce back and forth. Is it a big fish? What is it? How many? Okay, we with me so far. Now, this is my favorite part of the down scan. Images. If you just get out there and you just start doing stuff and looking, it's like you were going out in the desert or the forest hiking for deer. You're just going to go on trail hiking. You're just looking. 
If you go out on the Lake Fork with the down scan image and do that, you're going to find some pretty cool stuff. Pass that around. Don't tell me what you think it is because you're right. <laughs> That's a down scan image of a wagon wheel, founded by accident, idling in and out of the place, just watching my graph. Okay? Now I can show you some images that I'm going to start to tweak this a little and show you the most important thing about using a down scan when you're actually driving the boat. Is anybody here in the first seminar and I talked about graphing in figure eights? Okay. For the traditional sonar that shoots a cone, that replicates and makes a fake image in essence, it's really kind of making up, and it's good that we did real good with that old sonar stuff. I like the down scan. With the down scan, if you start turning, you distort. And it will mess you up. And you won't know what you saw no more. And it'll really get you goofy. So, when you go out and you're actually going over a hump, I want you to think straight lines. I want you to think either a grid, well, what I do is stars. So if I've got a hump, I want to go straight over the hump. When I get on the other side, I turn around, straight back over that hump. Now, a lot of times I'll, I want to hit it at six angles, really, in essence. So if this was the top of the hump, I'm going to come over it this way. I'm going to come over it this way. I'm going to come over it in the diagonal. I'm going to come over it at this angle. Like putting a star, you're looking, okay? The tracks will show like a star. But everything was done straight. With no turning while I'm in that. Okay, that's just down scan. You have side scan imaging, you can turn. So when I'm actually now, I'm running two sonars. I've got my sonar, I've got my down scan, I've got a full screen of sonar side scan. I can go ahead and do all that. I still run in my figure eights. I'm used to seeing the down scan distort. It doesn't make me go, oh my gosh, what's all of that? But I just don't want anybody to get out there and start working it, start turning on something wrong with my unit. If you are not running a nice straight line, by the way, less than three miles an hour. Anything three, four miles an hour in your down scan doesn't, doesn't keep up. Okay? Remember those important things. And I think on a final note, I'm, uh, I'm going to just briefly go into some side scanning, which is going to be the most difficult. And it has the, the most three-dimensional detail. When we're shooting the side scan, we're not on top of it. It's, you can literally shoot 150 feet to one side and 150 feet to the other, and you're scanning 300 feet all at once. Um, I can tell you on these lights, we don't do that. We don't get the detail. These units aren't big enough. They don't have enough power. Um, we're usually running 50-60. So I run 50-60 to the right, 50-60 to the left. Um, the key with the down scan and the side scan, the images are not hard. You don't have to interpret them or have someone tell you that is a tree. You should be able to see just like that wagon wheel that I showed you or that oak tree that I showed you. They show up and they look just like what they are. There's some side scanning. What are they? Huh? What are they? Fish. Fish. Okay. The side scan, down scan, don't be afraid of it. Choose your imagination when you're out there. Okay. If it's distorting and not giving you the image, call me, call Slade. We'll make sure that we get the image right. The imaging and all the settings are not difficult. You don't have to tweak on it a lot. There are some palettes and some other things that I like to use when I get into this. Later on in the on three, we'll talk about that. Same thing here. Some more side scanning. You're going to see some of the tweaking as the boat's turning. Another one going around. Dan's down scan. The boat is turning. So it's a tweaked image, just enough. So you still see all the fish on the tree. So, general settings, you don't have to have anything special, like the sonar. Sonar, we talked about some specifics and tweaking and, and noise rejection and all those things. Just have a basic setting on your down scan, same thing for your side scan. Um, there are palettes changing colors. Okay, those palettes help for create different shadows. If I'm looking for just structure, I may funnel through those palettes um, to see that the bridge comes up more defined in palette 4 or nine. So it's, these are things that I can't teach you. you got to go out there because there's a sense of imagination inside of this, just a little. It's not imagination, but you have to kind of get your creativity to go along and see if you can guess what this is. What are these? Let's just see the creativity. Don't answer it, just pass it through. What do you think that is? Don't answer it, just pass it through. Um, the down skin at first messed everybody up. A lot of guys would say they get really, really messed up. 
Um, I think it's unique. I think that you can go out there and learn things about the bottom that no, are no longer the interpretation. Remember we talked so much on the sonar, that first one. Mike said that's a tree. You have to believe me. So when you go out there and see your red blob, you're saying, mm -hmm, it's a tree. Mike said it's a tree. Unless you scuba dive down there and saw it yourself, your confidence isn't on anything other than what Mike said with the sonar, right? With the down scan image. You don't need Mike. If your setting's right, you're going to be able to say it's a wagon wheel, it's a tree, those are fish, that's a school of bait. Okay? So that it's something you guys need to get into. If you don't have it, it's worth the money. Um, a lot of the units these days will do just down scan. Um, they don't do the side scan, but you can get a basic Lorentz unit for about $599. It'll have sonar and a down scan, and that's kind of all you need. Um, this last image going around here is the way I want to prepare you guys for what's next. Side scanning is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult to understand. It's extremely difficult to try and use. There's a lot of ways to tweak it. It depends on what you're doing. What that last two images are is there's... If you count them, if you look at the shadows, there's about, I think, 13 or 15 big bass in that school. They were off to the side of me. Can you, can you pass that one back up here? And I want you to look closely. This is pretty much the same image. I want you in, the, in the very, very middle, just next to my cursor, you're going to see a little cursor. You see a little mark. If you go to the right, there's a fish. Okay, and because this is side scan, Sight scan casts shadows. This is my newest probably thing. That's what I want out of it. I don't quite care so much about the structure and what's there. I'm looking in depth into those three dimensional and those shadows that are cast behind it. This was a lesson for me. This particular day was an accident. It happened when it was all done. If you go back now and you find my little cursor that I brought up and you go right to the right It'll line up with one fish. If you look at that closely, if you need me to, I'll zoom in on my phone. You can actually see the shape of the fish and the tail and everything. Okay? And I'd like to actually do that. I'm going to get my phone. I want you all to see that the down scan image is capable, down scan, side scan image, of producing a perfect image and an exact image of the fish, tail and all. There's the cursor. Go straight to the right. There's my fish. Do you see his tail? Do you see the shape? Do you see the shape? Do you see the shape? See the shape of the fish right here? Hold this on. See the tail? Yeah. Do you see the shape of the fish? Do you see the tail? You confirm that. Can you zoom in a little for you here so you can see what I'm saying? see the shape. Right there. See the shadow? You can see the tail. Now here's, here's my lesson in this. A shadow does one of three things. Go outside and test it when you're done. A shadow either elongates, shrinks and magnifies, or casts the right image. One of the three. It's either, depending on the angle of the sun and your shadow, it's either shrunk and you go, wow, look how fat my fingers are. Or it's stretch and you go, wow, look how long my fingers are. Or you go, oh, that's a perfect shadow of my hand. So again, back to this picture, the fish that were farther away from me are elongated. Because they're farther away, more angle. Fish that are closer are underneath the boat. And the one in the middle, you can do this yourself. Again, as I pass it around, it's close enough to actually reproduce. Send it back there and you can see the tail of the fish. This is off Gen 1. Gen 2 and Gen 3 have even improved it even more. Some of the hummingbird stuff. And they'll really get some cool images. Eyeballs to boot and everything. So... This stuff's really the real deal. You need to break away from the sonars. If you aren't into the down scan, side scan, that's the next world of evolution. There are marlin guys that use side scan to see a blue marlin over one mile to their left or their right. Over a mile away. So, uniquely enough, my dad was in the military. In 1969, we had, the military had side scan. We could find ships, submarines, stuff like that. So... Um, I guess some of the biggest points that I can tell you is use your imagination. You're going to want auto settings, use your imagination, and go slow. Take your time. And the final thing is, does anybody have any idea where any of this stuff is as you find it? This is probably the most intriguing part of it. You need to get yourself some red markers, orange markers, if you use a down scan. The reason is there's going to be a little gap 
of you figuring out, well, I saw it on the graph. Where is it? Where, how far behind me is it? The down scan, side scan shoots off the back of the boat. Okay, It's happening. When you see it, it's already behind you. So when you first see it hit the screen, it's already behind you. How far behind you? Okay, That's what I'm going to lead you guys into waypoints. When you have an image and it comes up, I could bring that little cursor, slide it over to the tree, slide it over to the creek bin, slide it over to whatever piece of feature that I like, hit waypoint and make a waypoint. And now I can get rid of all the confusion in my head of going, where do I think? Well, I think it was about 20 yards. I just go drop the trolling motor. I turn around and I pull up on my waypoint. As we get into navigation, which is the final one, we'll talk about range rings, grids and how I know when I'm approaching that waypoint. How do I know when that waypoint's 20 feet in front of me so I can hit my target? That'll be the fourth final deal, okay? So I'm going to stretch this a little bit more into our next seminar, a little more in depth on the side scan, a little bit back, back step into some of it. It's hard to cover this. And then into navigation, which will be some actually how you run boat lanes, how you run some of the guide lanes safely, very safely, and you're actually on the line you're supposed to be not wondering that you're not. So the navigation one you want to be here for is going to include the waypoints. And uh, I think that's about all i got right now. Okay? Anybody have any questions? We're going to get ready to do the... You good, buddy? Yeah, I think so. Oh, Justin? Right. Anybody, how does everybody feel? Anybody weak on anything? Anybody like lost mm -hmm. with what I said? There questions there? are good, but if you're not quite with me, that's... It's a very simplistic answer to what's different in that transducer that gives you the 3D detail versus the old sonar. Probably that's uh, that's a really good classroom back behind the scenes, um, and I that's probably not where I'm the strength. My strength is on the water. But it is a transducer. Absolutely, it's 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 definitely a transducer. It's, um, something, something it's shooting on 800 hertz and 455 hertz okay. instead of 253 and 80. Okay. Um, so it is a different hertz. Good question. And if I really end up becoming a a sonar teacher. Right now I'm just expressing and teaching my on the water, hands on, 30 years of experience. There is some classroom stuff um, that okay, your so slate's going to be the best at why that. Why hang on to the sonar? Why don't you just do all 3D? Um, probably going to be eventually. With my confidence, I could go out there and do that. As I mentioned in this, there's some bounce back. Billy and I were just on the water the other day, and for over an hour we almost overlooked that the fish were, the, we, we forgot to look for arches in the grass. And boom, all of a sudden, I, I went, boom, wait a minute, there was four fish inside that heavy matted grass. And so, the down scan, I thought I'd show you that. I think an easy answer for me, if I can just kind of jump yeah. in here, because we're going, if you have a question for anybody at this point, it's time to ask it. Online, guys, if y'all have questions, please ask them. Um, if, for me, I always use one to confirm. One to confirm the other. You know, I like to run both, and, and, and when I see something on down scan, or if I see something... On sonar, and it sometimes can be hard to ascertain: is that a log? Is that a tree? Is that a brush pile? Then that's when you turn to the down scan and see the individual dots. And at the same time, if I'm going over grass and I see grass on my down scan, but I look it's like I might be able to vaguely see some dots, I can look at that sonar and see a hook instead of just a straight up and down column. So I always use one from the other. I really like you run both. Glad you said that. That was perfect. Just like I told you, sometimes I'm confirming. The sonar, but looking at the down scan, he's confirming the down scan. When we went over that grass with the down scan, we could not see that, and it was so dense. We had to have color to establish something to let that's us break. That's harder than this is. That's harder than the grass, et cetera, et cetera. And that color allowed us to realize that there was fish inside that grass. So, great. Good one. That's a good one. Who's next? No, we got a question. Question, question. There we go. I've got a couple of next ones. Um, how did you get, first of all, how did you get your images out of your phone? What did you put your hand? I just snapped the picture. Oh, okay. Yeah. That picture yeah. just just okay. okay. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, you've got to watch the reflection and stuff. Some of them are yeah. not there. Okay, I, I thought I'd get some sort of or something to pull okay. There is something I'm not familiar with, and I know some guys that can pull screenshots off their graph. I don't know how to do that. I'm not, there is. I'm you not can take it in. <laughs> is it, this is my actual first attempt. I've been wanting to do this for about 15 years. Um, this is my first attempt to really dig in and just give it all my best shot. And I like it so far. I hope you do. If I if, if it goes as well as I think in the years to come in the future, I'm going to try and get cla more classroom-oriented where I can draw a board and understand 
probably not important to us as much, but just for that person that wants the full deal. Um, good question. What was the second question? Yeah, the second question was, if, and it may jump ahead of what you already talked about, it sounds like, because I would go back, I'd want to put a waypoint on the shadow, or where do I put that waypoint? Okay, now, I, that's I, a great I, question. I jump ahead before great you. question. Great question. <laughs> when I'm on suspended fish like that, I wouldn't put any waypoint. What I'm looking for in that scenario is when do I want to fish, okay? And what I want to do is I want to find out, first of all, it, it gave me the association of where they were. So I immediately raised my hand and I looked and I went, well, where are they? If I'd have been out in the middle of nowhere, I would have said, God, that fish is out in the middle of nowhere. I want to surround myself with pods like that. So I would have kept working, kept working until I could say, hey, I feel like there's a pod like that over here. There's a pod over here. There's a pod working somewhere behind us. We're now in the middle of this puzzle. Now let's just go and free fish. In this scenario, they're actually using an edge of a creek. And so once I came, got, was I went in the mouth of this creek, man, I saw it. I went, oh, God, they're working that edge. So it was obvious. What it did is it told me where they were and gave me an immediate association of what they might be doing. So directly waypointing fish and suspension, I usually do. Um, I may give myself a mark. You can look at your map at that point and kind of go, okay, well, the fish are there. Well, I like this. I'll, I'll put my mark here, and, and I'll put, that's where I want the boat for throwing. And that'll come with association real quick. Once you start to do this, you'll, your associativeness of you're standing there, I'm going to be here, or I'm going to stand from here and throw at you. That associativeness on the water is probably the most challenging thing. Let me add to that question. So if you're doing that deal where you're trying to get pods surrounded, would you ever at that point then drop a, once you found kind of the location where you're surrounded, would you hit a waypoint there just to hold your boat Absolutely. in the middle of nothing? Absolutely. Yeah. As soon as you're surrounded, chuck a, you know, either hit, hit shelf a waypoint or chuck an orange buoy so that you kind of know. And ironically, at that point, if you start to kind of study the fish, don't fish for them, ask yourself, what are they doing? And you keep looking at that map, you keep looking at that map, all of a sudden you'll kind of see, you go, oh, well, this ridge is out over here. How they're corralling it there. The bigger picture comes into play, and you realize how they're using that area, just like the area. I, by the way, I want to say something. I got to spend some time fighting with this guy this week. <laughs> Can we get I'm the not fish? sure, yeah. Guru. This year you need to be in grass. You need to be in grass. A big bite. I mean, you may get some, but it's scratchy. There are a lot of fish in the grass. I mean, it's still a grind, but from what I was shown and what I learned this last week, that's where we, I We went out for, y'all saw the video with me and him on another lake, Rick's on Brandy Branch. I think everybody kind of figured that out when he said Brandy Candy. But, uh, oh, yeah, that's the name of my kid. Yeah, I'm serious. So, um, but no, it, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that puzzle was pretty, pretty good. But we actually, we did some time non filming together on Fork for just a few hours, and, and we ran some offshore stuff and looked at it. And, this, that, and the other, and then we ran back to one of the shallow areas that I've been utilizing all summer that has a massive grass flat on it. A lot more fish. And man, was there some fish back a there. A lot more fish. We put a few in the boat real quick, but then they cut off, and it's, it's, it's some, still tough. Yeah. But but it, there's a lot of life there, and you can visually see them because healthier. When healthier, they go to feeding healthier. in that grass, it, it becomes obvious, right? I mean, they happier fish. Up. You know, mm -hmm. the deep fish didn't get their third plane, so they're not real happy. Those, those fish in the shallows, they're happy. chasing. They're getting after it. When they feed, they're really getting after it. So. I have a question for you. Yes, sir. When you're doing this crappie stuff, how sensitive are those fish, like we talked about the lying on drop shot? So, can you use 10 pound test on those, or do you no, need sir. to use light line on no, those no. as well? Yes, sir. I'm using 6 pound test on okay. them. And does it matter? Does it have to be fluorocarbon? It could be mono. It just needs to be the light line. Right. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, small small man, or small I'm using good. fluoro, but I don't think it would cost you using mono. It's probably the same process. It's just because it's such a light little tiny bait, it's more alive. Yes, sir. I mean, just as, you know, if you do it in a bathtub or a sink, I mean, just the littlest rips, you're ripping it yeah, like yeah. crazy. So just let it sit there in your hand. You don't realize it's still working like a little bait fish. Is sure. Yep, yeah, we talked about that before. Everybody has a natural... Yep. Even if you're holding dead still, your hand's moving, and that's enough on a sensitive, set, you know, finesse the setter. Water's, the water's moving. moving it, so. Any more questions? Here? Yeah, up? What, one eighth ounce? Jig yes, sir. I'm, I'm used to about a quarter ounce right now. Yes, sir. If that's real windy. Because you're a little deeper? Yes, sir. And if I'm, it gets windy on me, then I'll go up, like I said, about eight inches to a foot, and I'll put a little split shot weight mm -hmm. to kind of hold it down. Yes, sir. Two weeks ago, you, you talked about the uh, coverage. Like the 2D cone? Mm -hmm. What about the downscale? 
It's wider than your much wider. You can set it. You can actually you adjust can, that. Yeah, you can completely adjust that. It's your down, down, your down scale. Yep. Not your side scale. Yes. Yeah. It's um it's running on four hundred and fifty five is what I run on shallow lakes and eight hundred on deep. So it's considerably wider cone. Yeah. Um you know, I've tried to guess that because I've out a lot of bridge pylons, you know. You've given me enough motivation, there's been enough questions. And I two things, I'm gonna be very respectful to Slade Daltry. I'm here, just keep here. He yeah. he does these for many, many years. Um I personally think that the on the water this should be fair enough that more than one guy can do that. You know, there's a lot of guys out there that know Lake Fork and you know can show somebody some things on the ground. We all but do to some degree. We all do to some degree. Question, yeah. The ability to go in a classroom like Slade does and do some of that background stuff, explain to you in more depth about the hurts. What exactly do those mean? Um, I probably should add that to my repertoire. Maybe you guys would have more confidence in me just to boot, but it's really a lot of unnecessary stuff. <laughs> I've been fishing all my life, and a lot of it is just, so just, when you to, run just on, more knowledge. It's not really... Uh, when you run on a 400 uh, deal on your down scan, and uh, you're in 20 foot of water, do, you have, do we know what the width of that is? Because I don't. 800s, 800s for deeper water, 450s for shallower water. So um, you'll notice that if you if you go to, like when we were at, at Brandy, Brandy Main, and we got into some 50, 60 feet of water, it might have been... been advantage to change that to yeah. the 800 to get more detail out of that deeper water. So really the hurts to me is, is two things. I just call them shallow water, deep water. Same thing with 280 and 50 on your sonars. If you're running 200, that's really a deep water. Um, 83 hertz and 50 hertz are for shallower. They widen the cone. Um, so the tighter the cone, you know, the deeper the water, by the time it gets down there, you've got a wide cone. When you've got a wide cone in deep water, you get nothing. You don't get that image. You don't see any so detail. for me, but there's more detail. It's a great question. Very great question. They mean more than that. But to me, it's just I've really simplified it. I run 455 hertz in shallow water and 800 hertz if I'm in a really deep lake, like <clears throat> Lake Powell or Lake Mead. Um, Here's something that I did. I kind of did by accident. It's something that I utilize on my down scan, side scan and stuff. I'll actually, when I'm looking at a spot, be running down scan and sonar on my map. But I have, and I don't even remember exactly what it's called for either. There's like a, you can overlay mm -hmm. the side image on your down image. Mm -hmm. So when I'm doing that, it'll just like, if there's something that pops off off to the side, it'll actually show like a shadow of it on my down scan. And I can then flip over there and go check it. So, I mean, I'm thinking of it as in the, the side scan image where I set it to 60 feet, 80 feet, whatever it is. That's how much ground I'm covering when I'm going over spot. Because if there's anything of interest, the shadow of it pops up on my down scan. And I then go back up right over the top of it. Once all this comes together for you and you're doing all of it at once, the illumination, the process of illumination is fast. I mean, you don't have to go out there and spend 40 minutes on a point to find out whether there's stuff there. Um, it used to be 40 minutes to an hour, with, you know, go back 25 years with a paper scroll, grayscale scale <laughs> graph, it took 40, 50 minutes on a point. Now it's a couple passes. Um, I typically run, a lot of times with a side scan now, I've learned that I can get out to 80 and 100. And the way I do it is I have two units. So the bottom half of one unit is left, the bottom half of the right unit is the right. And that gives me the full 12 inch screen so that it has enough room to show the detail at 100. If you do it on a split screen, you don't have enough room on that sonar. You're going to go, man, after about 80 feet, I don't see nothing but black. Um, so you have to do that. Um, it looks really odd that I'm really looking at two screens. Here's the left and there's the right. But the detail is phenomenal. And it allows me to get out to about 100 feet. It means I'm 200. That's 200 feet in one scan. And that's pretty good. Any more questions in the room? Yeah, yeah, one more. Go ahead. No, all, all you want. Unlimited. There's no quota. <laughs> Did you guys run your uh, mapping with your yep. sonar? Or your always. Yes. always. I, I couldn't get away with it. It didn't sound like y'all were. I always have to. I always so, do. I'll I'll give me an idea of what I'm going to. Maybe an exception or two. Like if it's something that I've just, if I'm fishing it every single I day. I know it. And, and I'm on that spot every single day, so I know exactly where every hump, bump, stump log is. And I'm just going over to check for fish. Then, you know, usually I'll pull up that bigger screen. But I'll tell you this. I prefer, honestly, even in that situation, sometimes I have second thoughts about it because I prefer to look at the same size screen uh, day in, day out. Mm -hmm. So if I've got that down scan and that sonar split on my right half like this, I want to keep it like that every time I look at it. The reason why is because... 
you get used to what does a five pounder look like? What does a eight pounder look like? And I can tell by the size of the arch, and then when you change the size of that screen, it can kind of mess you up on that because it's just a different parameter. So I, I will in, sometimes, out, um, yeah, you can really start to spin yourself out. I like to keep mine consistent. And, and you know, I know that I look at a lot smaller screen than a lot of guys do. And there's a lot of guys say, man, you need to look at a bigger screen so you can see more details. <laughs> and I'm like, not really, if I know what, a fish, if I know what a two pounder looks like on that, I don't need to see anything. As long as he gets the information from the detail, yeah. that's that's it. As long as he's getting the information in it. Yeah. Um, and that's so yes, I mean, I, and that's that's the bigger key to me is keeping it on the same size. I think is important. You do want in the beginning to have that map have some way to have yeah, a map because that's what gives you that association. That's where the light bulbs all sudden come on. That's where. Where, you know, have anybody ever seen a commercial where Skeet Reese is talking about his side scan? He says, well, I pulled up and I realized the fish were on north-facing stump points, you know, so I used my side scan to go find all the north pumps. I get, you know, once that association comes all of a sudden of where all this stuff is, it's, it's really going to become a very, very one good part of your our Total, total shameless plug here, guys. But I use this and I, I paid for it. I mean, I didn't get it for free. Ronnie didn't give this to me. But Ronnie does oh, yeah. sell the oh, yeah. legends of Lake Fork Chip. And if you fish Lake Fork on a regular basis, if you're out here more than anywhere else, you 100% need to buy the legends of Lake Fork Map Chip. It is by far the most precise. You've got satellite imagery from pre-impoundment. So you can literally see an isolated tree off the end of a point. You can see an old drilling platform. You can see satellite an image. old pond farm that's not marked on any other map. You can, I mean, there's stuff that's out there Ronnie that gave I me found. That. Really gave me that, and I ended up pulling off some of the, one of the coolest things that I've got to do here in four years on Lake Fork, and that was I cut a corner in buoys, and I cut it big time, and everybody says, you can't do that, and I've had Larry Lovell come scream at me, son, what are you doing, and I tell him, you know, I've seen the topographical satellite image, that was a farm, it was a pasture. Mm -hmm. It was a pasture. Yeah, it'll help you in that way, too. I can run just stuff. Boom, there you go. I just, I'm like, coming every time I come, I go, oh, pasture. Mm -hmm. I just keep going straight. People waving, screaming, what are you doing? You can't run there. So that little deal right there will help you find a tree you didn't know is there. It'll help mm -hmm. you find a fence line. It'll help you find a cottage foundation that's out there. Believe me, they removed a lot of houses. There's still concrete slabs out there. There's all kinds of stuff. It's amazing. It's incredible. I learned, and as far as running goes, I mean, years and years of, you know, being here back in 2011 and marking trails and setting middle waypoints for that, uh, that times 10 instantly because of what I can now see. I can run stuff I never could before. And I trust it because I verified it. I went over points where there was like three trees, and I saw every single tree correlated on my sonar and my down scan exactly to where it was on the map. I mean, it is phenomenal. Here's what it'll do for you, okay? Anybody been to myself? It took my friend 780 some odd waypoints in over two years of idling to fish. Idle every time he's, but while he's doing it, every time he bumped, he put a hazard mark. He's going in there. He's got to go in there. My little sand sc side scan my way every time, right? So every time while he's taking his people back, he's making marks, making marks, making marks, making marks, making marks. After two years, he was able to look at that map and go, "Wow, I got 700 and some odd hazard marks." <gasps> But look at how I can run through there. I got a friend of mine that runs full pad right from the launch all the way to the back. This, all the way back. Insert a map chip, load it, and it's done. So you got 700, 780, I think 83 black heads or white points. Any more questions? Don't catch a bad satellite. Huh? Don't catch a bad satellite. Yeah, yes. don't catch a bad Good point. point. We're yeah. going to talk about that. When I get to navigating, we're going to talk about that. One of the very, we'll go ahead, since you brought it up, we'll say it now. One of the very first things, if you are navigating with your units, and I want you to be comfortable enough, I do. I fly in just like an airline pilot flies under the hood. There are stuff, there are runs that I make on fork where, yeah, I'm looking where I'm going, but it's all about what mm -hmm. that graph's telling me. Mm -hmm. And nothing but what that graph is telling me, especially after what I just showed you about the zoom down on it. Yeah. It is precise. When you power that thing on, the very first thing it's going to do across that bottom. If you even get to talking, someone comes out and goes, Hey man, how are you this morning? You're not looking at your sonar no more. On the bottom, you'll see that it'll come up and it'll tell you how good of a signal it got. If not, go into your satellites and find out. But if you do not have a strong signal, it comes up and you'll see like sometimes you'll see a little flashing thing in the bottom or a little signal. Is, it's telling you I didn't grab the satellite very good. Don't run by me right now. Turn it off and back on. Um, that can really, it can kill you.
you're on a trail, you think you're on that trail, and you're not on that trail. So there is some specifics in there. There's a reason that they put. Usually, market. when it's off, I mean, it'll kind of show us. I mean, it you'll know. You know you'll about know. by your familiar surroundings that hey, this isn't. This don't feel right. Be, Something's yeah. not quite right. Usually, too, a lot of some track it'll start goofing. It'll, something will show you, but be be cautious. Any more? Any more in the room? Good question. Got a couple online. What you got, Kev? Any ideas? What the bass think the tomato color relates to? <laughs> Any ideas what the bass think the tomato color? Relates to well, yes, yes, I do. I got this one. He's got this one right here. <laughs> Same thing as a red rattle trap. Anybody have any it, idea what that really is? That tomato, <laughs> especially in dirty water, okay, is orange. To a fish, it's orange. When you throw a rattle trap in grass, and we all say we throw red rattle traps, what color do we actually throw? Orange, orange. to gold, right? Yep. Orange with gold highlights, something in that color spectrum. The brim in this part of the world are orange. Yeah, they turn dark in the summer and they get that green pumpkin, but on their belly, and where does the fish look when he eats? Everything's above him, right? Most of the time. Orange. So that orange color, the reason that red or orange works so well in East Texas, is not actually has zero to do with crayfish. People get that mistaken all the time. Oh, I was that do, guy. Do crayfish turn bright red when they spawn? Absolutely, they do. They do, 100%. But that's like two weeks, and we catch them on red stuff year-round. It's brim, guys. It's brim. You can actually go back and see a video that me and Kevin did back in January where I picked up a little brim, just a little perfect eating size for a bass brim that was floating dead on the surface, and I showed an up-close shot of him, and you can see just how orange that thing is. And the reason why that pattern is more known for in the winter is in the summertime when the sun comes out, they get more green pumpkin on them, and they have less and less orange. But if you look at that one that, we, that I picked up in January, almost that entire brim is orange, bright orange. When we were at Brandy Branch, we put the boat, we went to get the truck, and I just kind of looked over the side, and I, for the first time in my entire life, I saw a brim that had orange fins. And I'd actually taken and dyed my tail chartreuse on my favorite brim jig that has orange on it. I wish I'd have done more. Once I saw that, I actually grabbed him and I said, look at this, this is odd. He said, no, it's not odd. And just explain to me what he explained to you. So I just learned that firsthand. That's exactly what that tomato is. Thanks for that awesome <laughs> explanation. Now I know what a doggone rattle, red rattle trap is doing in yeah. February. I actually throw a lot of things orange uh, because of that reason. So yeah. I would have never ever thought. I thought crawfish and that was something that I was not one of my strengths. Now I can have confidence. There, there's know something, what I'm doing. look, there's something too on that red drop shot worm to just being different. I mean, just being different than something they see. And when you're fishing in deeper water, which we usually are with that red drop shot, uh, those fish aren't seeing that color that well. It's something bright and, and, and stands well, out. will actually turn black. There you the go. You go. Really? The you get. Well, there's actually a scientific study from uh, Oklahoma University back in the 90s that said that red is number one and blue is really close behind it, number two. And all the other colors, there's a huge gap after that. But red and blue penetrate the, the color stays the, yeah. the color the deepest in the water column of any color out there. So that's why we use so much red and blue flake because it shows up more in dark water. Perfect. Scientifically, we, we've all been doing it, but nobody really, well, we just throw watermelon red. Why? Nobody really understands why. It's just a good color, but that red actually penetrates the light deeper than any other color in the, in the, in the color spectrum. So. What else, Kev? I know we got another online one. This one was for Justin. Uh, how does Billy stay so skinny? I bet I know who posted that question. He's vegan. I'm um, what? He's vegan. And I'm vegan. the opposite of vegan, bro. <laughs> yeah, he is just in the burger he ate with. Man. Oh my god, he looked at me and he said, I'm sorry. I went, for what? And then the waitress came. <laughs> I do like my groceries. I do like my beef. That's true. You know what? Though? Oh, come on. Come on. Ask him a fishing question. I carry it well, right? Yeah, so, so, absolutely. I mean, I'm still good looking. This was somebody named Ronnie that asked this. Oh, okay. Well, thanks, Ronnie. I appreciate that. Uh, in fact, you know what? I'm going to put together a diet and exercise program <laughs> video, and you can buy it for uh, $599. Perfect. All right, any, any more questions, questions in the house? Any more online Q&A? Uh -uh. All right. Well, hey, Justin, thanks for coming back and seeing us again, buddy. Appreciate it, as always. Justin did a good crop and talk, Mike. Thank you. I know that electronic stuff. It's tough. It's phenomenal it's a, with this guy. So. It's a tough one to actually teach. Um, 
I know that uh, I'd like to invite each of you on the water. It's sometimes on hands, it's even easier, but I really do want to get this under my belt. I'm, I'm working that hard. I'm thinking about it all week. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, hey, and that's what matters most. We're building the community feeling. I think we're all helping each other catch more fish, whether it's on there, whether it's in person. We love seeing you guys in person uh, even more. Right now, I'm fixing to get Mr. Ronnie. I know he's got some stuff to give y'all. Just to say thanks for coming and participating, because that is honestly what this is all about. Absolutely. And you guys that are here, we hear this every week, but for those that aren't, I just want to say it again. Man, this is about building a community to help each other catch more fish, and that is all it's about. It. Will our guide service benefit? Possibly. Maybe. Might, might even say probably. But 100% for sure, this is about helping each other catch more fish. And so, like Ryan said, if you guys have suggested topics, if y'all want to hear about anything in particular, please let us know. You can comment on the videos after they post. You can let us know right here today. What you got, sir? I do have a question. Yes, sir. When you do find a fish and you're, you're fishing them for a little while and then all of a sudden they quit and, you know, and then you can't find them, where, I guess my question is, where are the fish actually going? Are they usually staying in that general area or are they just like leaving the area and going? Ty typically, the well, it depends on the wind, it depends on the bait, it depends on a lot of things. There's a yeah. lot of different things that can happen. But what I've found what will happen, especially in the summertime, is those fish will be more scattered. And when the timing's right, whether it's a pickup in, in the wind speed, a change in wind direction, whatever it is, when the timing's right and the bait gets in the right areas and everything lines up, those fish that are scattered will come together in a tight school and work together to herd bait on the structure, the dynamic different structures that we're talking about. Sometimes that dynamic structure is the top of the water. Sometimes it's the point whatever. After they're done feeding, and maybe after you've caught some of them, this happens. Sometimes you'll catch a few and the school will break up. That's what we always call breaking up. That's for me, in my opinion, that's what I think happens. They scatter when things are right, they come together, and then when things they either get tired of eating or you catch them or whatever, something happens, they break up and they scatter and tend to suspend in the summertime. Very, very in depth question. Depends on the timing. There's a lot of factors. Um, there's a lot of factors. They can travel.